So there is a problem with the very premise of this video. I am by nature a very charitable reader. When an ongoing story makes a decision that concerns me, I like to assume that there's a good reason for it. As I hope I've shown by the fact that this is my fourth video on the Dragon Prince, I think this is a very smart show. This is to say, I'm making this video before Season 6 comes out, and I'm going to be presenting you with an interpretation of the character of Erevos that I find interesting. To do so, I will be assuming that the show is not in the process of making a fundamental mistake in storytelling. But I'm also a cynic, and I hate looking stupid. So, in the interest of my enormous ego, I'm going to be explaining why the show might be in the process of making a fundamental mistake in its storytelling. Proceed with skepticism. Aravos was immediately compelling to me. I mean, obviously, I'm a misanthropic genderfuck. Aravos is very much my aesthetic. But more than that, there's nothing more compelling than a villain who plays it close to the chest. He's obviously enormously powerful, but we only see glimpses of that here and there. He's not interested in conspicuous shows of power, he likes to play it cool. Right after Viren accepts Erebos' help, he gets attacked by Opeli and a bunch of royal guard types. Erebos is given no information to go off of, is blindsided because he didn't know that Viren was actively being hunted down, and oh yeah, he's in jail miles away. And even with all that going on, he's still this calm, formidable force. He takes over Viren's body, casting spells through him and the staff, and he's just so sure of every move he makes. Duh, it's so cool! I was a bit disappointed with how the fight ends. The fact that he didn't have a response for, like, a couple people with bows and arrows just didn't feel right to me. But then, in Season 3, he astral projects himself into Luxaria and dissolves a person's body with a single touch. And you're like, okay, the guy's a fucking menace. But it's more than just his power that remains mysterious. His actions are also sort of inexplicable. Erevos is pretty transparently a satanic figure. You know, the morning star, the fallen angel who incites rebellion in humankind. One that challenges the power of God with sheer infernal rage. And yet, he works by supplicating to humans, appearing as a humble serpent, or a twink who offers to serve you at first meeting. He's extremely concerned with the way power presents itself. That's both a strategy as well as a sort of aesthetic sensibility. One of the first things he says to Viren is, how may I serve you? He's not embarrassed because he's not proud. He is extremely confident in the knowledge that he is stronger and smarter than everyone around him. So what need does he have to appear strong? He hates ostentatiousness. Of the little we know about his internal world, he is clearly revolted by what he repeatedly refers to as arrogance. The other star-touched elves are big-headed and self-aggrandizing. The Dragon King is an arrogant monster. He uses Kessa's bigotry and pompousness over humans to destroy her kingdom and mocks her for it. Before, and I can't say this enough, freaking dissolving her body. Honestly, work. Everyone in power is an arrogant fool, and when they get too big for their britches, Erevos wants to see them get put in their place. We still don't know his entire reason for seducing humans the way he does. I certainly believe he has a genuine fixation with them. Maybe he respects and admires them. Maybe he simply doesn't fear them. But even before he gets locked away, he works through people. Ripples depicts Erevos' descent to Earth, becoming the fallen star. The sky opened its maw and spat from its black jaws a tiny star. The falling star plummeted down and down and down until it struck the breathless world below. With its impact came a long and terrible night. The earth bled. With its impact, a sea forms where there was none. And when a human touches the surface of the water, ripples form and distort the dazzling reflection of the stars. Literal or not, this is clearly Erevos' perception of the dichotomy between the hubristic and the humble, the stars and humankind, gods and their subjects. 
In another story, Erevos vividly recalls the experience of eating an apple given to him by a human. Besides furthering the satanic imagery, at least in the minds of English speakers, it also gives us a sense of his internal drive. The moments that stick with him are those of humble human joys and actions, and displays of ugly vanity on the part of magic users. This really sums up my fascination with Erevos. He's defined by these terrible and sublime stories and actions, but always with the vague understanding of himself as the underdog. And he's not totally wrong, either. As powerful as he is, he has repeatedly aligned himself with David, humankind. Erevos commits acts of extreme violence with a blithe smile, but to me this isn't indicative of an innate lack of empathy. To me, it feels more like an expression of his commitment to his goals, always with that fixation on arrogance. He has a firm understanding of how power works in his world, and every time he predicts someone's actions correctly, he gets further confirmation that he's in the right. And in a story that is thematically about investigating the reasons for violence, primarily the ways in which defense can be contorted into a need for aggression, it seems to me that Erevos' unique brand of violence offers something new and unique into the story. That assuredness, the aggression coming from a place of active hate rather than passive fear, is something that Viren and Claudia don't really have. Whatever his motives are, he's rooted in them. So let's interrogate his motives. We haven't really seen his internal world explored yet, so we're just gonna look at his actions and see what we can intuit from there. So first and most obviously, he gave humans dark magic. Now, I've said this before in this series, but I'll just say it again, I don't understand the problem with dark magic. Listen, I'm about 90% a vegetarian, I'm not great at it, but I can understand the desire to not want to cause harm when unnecessary. So, killing magical beings? It's not my favorite thing, I'll grant you that. But it's super clear that magic is a material necessity in this world. We know of at least one instance when a hundred thousand human lives were saved because of magic. Imagine other instances where they weren't. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, humans were given primal stones, but clearly not enough to survive. Also, given the fact that at least one human can do primal magic, it seems like there was at some point a concerted effort to convince humans that they couldn't do primal magic. It's all very good to preserve the environment and protect creatures, but you can't do that at the expense of eating or defending yourself. The contempt you have to have for another person to deny them the right to continue living makes you at the very least a biased actor. You have no right to judge the worthiness of a person you deem unworthy of safety. Listen to the language Kessa uses to show her contempt for dark magic. Your kind could not be satisfied with what you are given. Doesn't that just make your blood boil? In this moment, I felt a weird sort of solidarity with humanity, in their world and in mine. The story of our world is one of clawing our way out of the darkness, staggering with every step forward and slipping as we're dragged back into the mud. Because even on this beautiful, amazing planet, our existence has been about misery and the fight to escape misery. We have to eat life forms to survive, and I think our psychology is influenced by this innate cruelty that we're all forced to live by. Being a human is not easy and we weren't given anything by anyone. I feel that we are supposed to understand this statement as emblematic of the unique, anti-human bigotry Zadians are taught to believe. Consider, Sol Regum kills an entire city of humans in order to stop one guy from doing what is essentially hunting. The guy blinds him, again, in an effort to stop a genocide from occurring, but fails, and the people are burned alive. And the consequence of this is that humans get displaced for the crime of being subjected to a holocaust. Look how devalued the lives of human beings are. Humans have been subjected to a deeply ingrained system of violence on the part of the powerful. This society is not equal in power. And so you can't hold humanity equally culpable for doing dark magic as you would hold a dragon for killing civilians en masse. So, Erevos hands them a meal ticket, and humans have to take it. Tell me what I'm missing, because that literally just seems like praxis to me. 
There is some indication in Ripples that Erevos somehow gave humans primal magic. Humans are said to have been given a gift that they shouldn't have had, then we are told. They nurtured their precious primal flames secretly, as cultivating its glow drew the eyes and ire of monsters. For the audacity of their fire, they were hunted. And that's when Erevos fell. So, it looks like Erevos is punished for somehow giving humans primal magic. And, having been cast down, he begins giving them dark magic. It seems like he tried to do the right thing, and that got him exiled, and made humans a target. So, what was left? He aligns himself with the beings he has more or less become responsible for at this point. He gives them new means of providing for themselves, but obscures his own involvement. Doesn't let on that he's protecting them, because that went very poorly for him before. In a way, this Goliath has found himself on the side of David, and they really need his help. So, it seems like a foregone conclusion that things like fairness and justice are among his most compelling motivators. Hand in hand with this, we have the recurring theme of humiliation and arrogance. He's cast from the heavens, and it mortifies him. His place in the hierarchy is shaken. So he resents those at the top, calls them arrogant, and sets to work turning their pride against them. His second set of actions is following and aiding Viren, which is transparently an attempt to get out of prison. Which... <sighs> bro. He's been in isolation for 300 years? Fun fact, that's torture. In countries like Belgium, Germany, and Sweden, it isn't even illegal to try to escape prison. It's considered a fundamental part of humanity to want to be free. Even here in Freedom Town, USA, we generally don't put people in solitary confinement for literal years. It does happen, don't get me wrong. But when it does, we see it as a horrific crime. Alfred Wood Fox was in solitary confinement for 42 years, which is thought to be the longest stretch of solitary confinement in American history. And if that number, 42 years, doesn't fill you with rage, well, Hopefully you're in the minority. And Erevos has one means of escape, becoming useful to someone on the outside. And that someone just so happens to be interested in conquering Zadia. Which is pretty convenient, because Erevos seems to be interested in that too. Is your wish to rule Zadia? So, you wish to conquer Zadia? And this bright future will require us to conquer Zadia? So, why? Well, revenge seems to be a good place to start, but that only tells me that he's a messy bitch who lives for drama, and if we're being honest, I kind of already assumed that. So let's find something more interesting. Yes, he wants revenge, but think about the method and style of his revenge. His vehicle for revenge is a human, a dark mage no less, and he didn't even have to find him, he sort of fell in his lap. How poetic. Oh, the irony is... Wonderful. So he makes himself indispensable to Viren, offers to serve him, a great one, once an exemplar of all a magical being could be, at the right hand of a human who does perverted magic. He finds liberation and joy serving a human, even though he's aware of his power over him. In one moment, he's calling Viren his vessel, and in the next, he offers him a staff like it's a scepter. He allows himself to be ruled by one whom he considers to be inferior. And while this is all very practical, it also seems to speak to his ideas and his sense of self. The subversion in and of itself is an act of destruction. He destroys the expected hierarchy of powerful over powerless. Through conquest, he continues the destruction, trying to kill a baby dragon, which will go on to be the next arrogant monster. Killing a queen for daring to purify a human who has done what he could to survive. His sense of justice and his hatred for a system that has continuously denied it to its most vulnerable tells me that he probably came to his current worldview through a genuine position of kindness, which was transformed through ostracism. I want to add that the desire for correction or revenge is a bit more viscerally justifiable than we might be led to believe. Like, I'm not saying he's this freedom fighter whose evil actions happen to be totally woke if you really think about it, 
No, he is not just fighting for justice on behalf of others. There is every indication that Erevos has very good reasons for turning against the political elite among dragons and elves. The actions of the people who imprisoned him are monstrous, especially for a show as grounded in modern sensibilities as the Dragon Prince. They essentially prosecuted and sentenced him without a trial, and no chance to explain himself. Maybe in a myth I'd be more sympathetic, if this was a detached telling of a story that began long ago, but we are very much present in this world. We hear from a number of living beings who can remember when this all went down. No one is talking in these and thous. Erevos is a character we have seen with our own eyes. He's not Sisyphus, whose life and punishment feel remote. It's all too grounded for us to sincerely believe that Erevos deserved to be summarily imprisoned without recourse. Even if this was a protective measure, this feels much more like a kidnapping than a justified imprisonment. The evil deeds of our boy Erevos are almost laughably vague. Every great crisis the world faced seemed the work of some ingenious and powerful leader. But in each case, it was secretly Erevos whispering in their ear. Every great crisis? What, every famine? Every time some guy burned down a country because some dude looked at his wife? Sol Regum incinerated a hundred thousand people, including children. Did Erevos orchestrate that too? This is a profoundly stupid thing to say, and I can only assume that it is a retrospective justification for their actions. Or maybe just an absolution of what seems to be a really cowardly and avoidant way of dealing with real problems. Whispering in someone's ear, whatever that means, isn't a crime. People are responsible for their own actions. The stories of Viren and Claudia demonstrate how tragically important that principle is. They live in a world where every evil deed they do feels necessary, righteous even, and we can empathize with them. But they are still accountable for their actions, regardless of what or who influenced them. Of the three big antagonists of the show, Erevos is the only one not offering excuses or justifications for his actions. He seems almost free of any need for it. It's like he's working outside of small-minded schematic frameworks where actions need to have moral worth in a sort of external way. If he doesn't need to convince anyone of his strength, Maybe he doesn't need to convince anyone of his goodness, either. Maybe he's just so evil that he enjoys doing things that he knows are wrong. Or maybe he's the only one with a moral code so close to being perfect that he has no need for endless affirmations. Maybe now you can see why I'm half excited and half wary of whatever the next two seasons have planned. If our cast is really deluded into believing that all of the complexities of cruelty and mistrust and anger and dread and loneliness can be boiled down to a pretty boy whispering into the ears of powerful people, that can lead to some good shit. What if our heroes are wrong and our villains right? What if Erevos actually has something to teach them? Wouldn't that be the coolest possible outcome for this show to have? Our heroes are persuaded by him, and the world ends up being all the better for it? It seems to me like this is the logical thematic conclusion for a show like The Dragon Prince. So far, we've built immense empathy for our human villains, but never been invited to hear how their perspectives could be incorporated into the social fabric of a better world. Viren's voracious hunger for recognition isn't distinct from the generational issues of humanity being degraded for centuries, but a natural byproduct of it. Claudia's desperation to keep her family together and whole and safe feels like the most intimate expression of how cruel an unjust world can be. Not just hurting you, but pulling away those you love. Erevos is an angry outcast for extending kindness outside of his in-group. What might our heroes learn from that? Of course, the more excited I feel, the less likely this possibility sounds. Even Steven Universe made its bad guys evil, even if it went on to reform them ludicrously fast. I don't know, I'm not good at telegraphing the ideas of other writers. Maybe they are just setting him up to be super Hitler. When Zubeya said that, 
stupid fucking line in season four. Whispering in their ear. My first thought was, this literally has the potential to break the show. Viren is one of the best antagonistic forces I've ever seen. The show is just relentless in its dissection of him. But at the end of season five, even he is talking about dark magic as if it's the problem, which is the same stupid bullshit that Harrow was saying in season one. But the problem, dear viewers, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. Didn't you know that? I'm not blaming you, it's the show. What, are we going to absolve every character from every bad thing they've ever done? Is Viren no longer responsible for his bad deeds? I can't help but think that Harrow was fundamentally flawed in his assessment of dark magic in the first season. And Sarai, too. The idea that dark magic is essentially bad because it's a shortcut that incurs a blood price sounds like superstitious nonsense to me. It may be bad, there are essential evils in the world, but it's bad for reasons that can't be metaphysically philosophized away. It's the harm that you did to another being. You chose to kill the Magma Titan to save lives. Sometimes you have to choose one evil over another. The idea that dark magic is the only evil at play is to take a moral shortcut on your own behalf. You have to reckon with the morality of the actions you've taken. These layers of moral obfuscation are very concerning to me. It's this odd idea that evil is some ultimate conscious thing that abuses us, rather than a ubiquitous thing that manifests through our actions, whispering in their ear. That line really pissed me off. In the very beginning of this series on the Dragon Prince, I talked about my definition of themes. They are the windows through which we can viscerally and emotionally understand a story. Themes are the level of text at which we can see real life being imitated. We don't have magic, and these characters never existed, but we have violence and injustice and death. And when we see these lifelike concepts being synthesized in the trance of story, we feel tension and catharsis. And what I'd like to leave you with is a reminder that themes are the mechanisms stories use to communicate with us. Not always to deliver a cheesy Aesop, that's not what I'm saying. But they offer up observations of the world that the writer wants you to consider or at least meditate on for a while. When a theme communicates a message that we can understand, we feel enlightened and surprised. And when it doesn't, we feel cheated out of a good conversation, as if the ideas that the piece conjured in our minds weren't actually worth discussing. The antagonists of the Dragon Prince are so clear in their attempts to communicate with us. I can't help but want to throw them a lifeline, even defend them on some level. Even Erevos, whose actions seem so joyfully cruel, inspires understanding and compassion. These guys are really well written, and the three of them enrich the show immeasurably. But a conversation is only ever as good as its ending, which is why a disappointing finale can feel so awful. So I guess the message is, Get your petitions to redo the finale ready early. I have yet to hear a shippy name for Justin Richmond and Aaron A. Hodge, so I have taken it upon myself to come up with Arston. I think that's kind of cute. Petition for Arston to prematurely redo the final two seasons of The Dragon Prince, but only after watching this series. That's a very important part.